Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first installment of the Epsilon chapter of Ada Sigma Phi's lecture series, The Little Things. My name is Hannah Huzzy. I'm the president of this chapter, and I've had the absolute pleasure of organizing this series as a way for all of us to celebrate the little things in classics that bring us joy and to share that joy with others. So our guest speaker tonight is the wonderful Magistra Ginny Lindsay, a former teacher and dear, dear friend of mine. So I'm gonna read this bio that she sent real quick to kind of introduce her. So Ginny's first real exposure to the classical world came when as a wee middle schooler, she was allowed to watch the racy I Claudius on PBS. Within a few short years, she found herself competing at junior classical league competitions and bringing home ribbons in dramatic interpretation of Latin poetry. Not long after, she attended the University of Texas at Austin, taking numerous courses from one of her JCL judges, the inimitable and brilliant Bill Nethercutt, who sadly passed away this August. His joy and passion for teaching and languages was passed to each of his students, especially to his student teachers, including Ginny. Ginny also discovered a talent for graphic design along the way, which she first utilized as editor for the Texas Classical Association for 10 years, publishing both, both the semi-annual journal Texas Classics in Action, as well as the semi-annual TCA newsletter. When websites began to appear in the 1990s, Ginny created the first TCA website, the first website for ACL's National Committee for Latin and Greek, as well as the first website for Camus's Committee for the Promotion of Latin when she became chair of the CPL. When Professor Rick LaFleur, emeritus from the University of Georgia and editor of Wheelock's Latin, wanted to set up an official website for this best-selling textbook and its many ancillaries, Ginny put her talents to that task. The last website she designed, which was not a personal website for herself, was for her friend Lindsay Davis, best-selling novelist of romance and fiction. Ginny designed and maintained not only Lindsay's first website, but the two incarnations which followed, and only surrendered this labor of love when she began teaching at Dripping Springs High School. In 2004, Ginny set up a shop at cafepress.com called Anima Ultra, her other self, as an outlet for her interest in typesetting and design, where she could offer beautifully designed Latin-themed t-shirts, mugs, mini buttons, posters, and now face masks. In 2018, she opened an Etsy shop called Latin Classroom Stamps, so Latin teachers everywhere could stamp quizzes and assignments with Optime Factum, Mirabile, and Foci Non Facio. Ginny's creativity was perhaps best utilized in the classroom teaching Latin. Her passion for learning to read Latin as a language and not a code from left to right with sensitivity to phrasing and word choices infused her classes from day one. Students found her room welcoming, engaging, fun, and occasionally filled with cries of de silite milites, followed by her leaping off a desk, sometimes holding a sponge on a stick. Without question, the Latin program at Dripping Springs High School has been quieter since her retirement last spring. Ginny's love of letters, of type, and of calligraphy has drawn her to the inscriptions and graffiti of Pompeii and Herculaneum. Her presentation, Dead Voices Speak, features inscriptions from buildings, funerary monuments, cups, cones, jewelry, and graffiti. It is from these inscriptions that we hear from the everyday people, their loves, their losses, and even their pets. So without any further ado, let's welcome Magistra Ginny Lindsay. Okay, thank you so much. I'm gonna share my screen. So, I'm going to also move my participant bar. You're on the watch for the chat. Remember, if you would like to ask any questions, why don't you put them in the chat to begin with in case they are important for, um, for me to answer while I'm on a particular screen. Otherwise, we'll do questions at the end. So, welcome to Dead Voices Speak, Inscriptions and Graffiti from the Ancient World. This was a presentation that I originally made, a very simplified version, uh, for students at school during International Week, because I felt like this is where we really hear the Roman. So of course, when we're looking at inscriptions, people think of inscriptions like what is on the Pantheon. And if you haven't really learned to read the abbreviations and so forth on inscriptions and get used to the way inscriptions work on monuments. Here's just a, a quick little review. First of all, 
the little dots that are in between uh, uh, in the spaces between words are interpunks and they do help reading monuments um, make it so much easier anyway so this monument is actually Marcus Agrippa, son of Lucius, made this building when consul for the third time. Actually, it's Hadrian that did the remodel, but the original building. So for those of you who know your Latin, remember that you're going to have this kind of phrasing where you'll have the noun and then you'll have an F for either filius or filia, for son or daughter, and then the father's name and the genitive tucked in the middle. It's really kind of nice when you get used to that nested phrasing in Latin. It makes it so much easier to read. So we've got monuments like this that you see on buildings. You'll see similar things on coins. Uh, I wish I could say I purposely chose this to be the coin that followed the one with Marcus Agrippa on the previous building. It was just I wanted a woman. And then I realized, oh, well, this is fortuitous. Because in this one, we have the inscription Agrippina MF or Marquifilia Mater Gai Caesaris Augusti. In other words, we have Agrippina, the mother of, I mean, the, the daughter of Marcus, the mother of Gaius Caesar Augustus, in other words, Caligula. And this coin was. Um, was uh, issued late in the day, I cannot think. This coin was issued when Caligula brought her remains back to Rome. She had been exiled and she died in exile. He brought the remains back and we see on the reverse of the coin, the SPQR, the Memoria Agrippinae for the memory of Agrippina and the carpentum, the type of carriage that a woman of her status in the imperial family was allowed to travel in even when no one else was allowed in wheeled vehicles in Rome. Anyway, so traditional things that you see. Once again, the interpunks are there to help us with the spacing and to understand what we're seeing and the difference between the different words, but we don't always get that. For women, although we do see some Imperial women on coins, more often than not, the only place you're going to see women in inscriptions, with a few exceptions, of course, are in funerary monuments. This one, these monibus, minutiae suavis, publi sextili campani, vixit anis, quator decem, mensibus acto, viebus. Vigenti fecit, Tiberius Claudius Vavis Pater Iissimus, which starts out very traditionally, like most uh, funerary monuments, either DM or Dis Manibus or Dis Manibus, to the divine spirits, that is, to the ghost gods. And then usually the next line is also dative. In this case, they're using a genitive, I guess an objective genitive here, Minuciae Suavis, for Minuciae Suavis this lovely girl here. She is of, so wife of, that is she belongs to Publius Sextilis uh, Campanus. Right, so we've got who she belongs to. And then we have this line here, it's very crowded, very crowded. Weeks at Anis, she lived 14 years, eight months, 23 days, right? She lived only 14 years, eight months, 23 days. She's married to this guy, Publius, but fake it. Who made this? Tiberius Claudius Suavis. He made it for Minuciae. He is a pater piesimus. He is a very devoted father. He's the one that made the monument. Because if you think about it, if she's only 14 years old and she's somebody's wife, he's not known her for very long. And of course, she probably died in childbirth. So a sad stone, but not an uncommon one. But it does make you think this is a person 
like you and me. Well, except she got married young. But I mean, she is not somebody great like Agrippina, the elder in the previous coin, or Marcus Agrippa. Anyway, on this inscription, this one, you have to really kind of know the formula because there's no spaces. There's no interpunks to help us. There are a couple of big spaces here, yes. But everything else is very compact. And so you have to kind of know the formula, expect datives, genitives, the sorts of things in the formula to help you read them. Oh, and by the way, on numbers, expect them to be additive. If you were wondering why that wasn't XIV, it's because more traditionally, you're gonna see them additive. But that's a whole nother story. I can point you a good video on that. So, devoted fathers love their children. Devoted families love their dogs. This one, in a lovely all dative, which we expect. This is a funerary monument set up for Helena, foster child, alumni. In animae incomparabili et bene merenti. Right, she is an incomparable soul and well deserving. This doggy, and I love monuments like this to a dog where we see not the hunting hounds. This is some short-legged, fat lap doggy, right? You can see a little curl of her tail. She's a happy little dog, like the dog that probably ran over this tile. And I love this inscription because it talks to us about the person that owned the dog. Um, and also, we're going to, you know, we're allowed to geek out here. I like the lettering here, it's not our traditional Trajan caps as we would call them now or, or just capital letters. It's got a little bit of, I don't know, the um, kind of lettering we see in calligraphy. Of course, children are not invisible entirely. Usually we don't see much of them, but a nice abecedaria or the alphabet. Uh, and in fact, seen an alphabet like this and you will find them all over the place in Pompeii. I think there's even one that's upside down underneath where a bench would have been in one of the, the like dressing rooms at a bathhouse, practicing their alphabet. But the alphabet, although this doesn't look too bad, it, a lot of the letters will end up not looking very familiar, right? E and F don't look like we expect. We're also gonna see a lot of letters that look a little bit weird to us. And I'll be bringing that, um, this little guide back up on some of the other scribe, uh, slides. So we have the Labyrinthus Hicabit Minotaurus, where, I mean, this is a doodle from some kid's paper, except it's not a paper, it's on a wall. But I could see my students doing this. The Hicabitat, very easy to read. The min notaurus, not as bad, although we're not used to words being split wherever they feel like it. But this word labyrinthus, labyrinthus, that R is totally weird. But we'll get used to it. This is the kind of R they would have made when scratching on a wax tablet with a metal stylus, or in this case, scratching on a wall, probably with the same metal stylus. We know they love their gladiators in Pompeii. And they have lots of um, graffiti like this one. This is very readable for us. It's almost all that nice um, uppercase looking letters. Nothing looks too weird except for we've got this backward C. And the backward C refers to a corona, which is the wreath that you could win if you had an exceptionally good fight. So these, uh, the names are abbreviated, but the M at here is abbreviated for Marcus Attilius. This is apparently, they were gonna have a go at writing it here and they didn't or something, who knows, but then they've written underneath. Um, M Attilius Pugnarum, Roman numeral one, Conorarum, Roman numeral one, and then a V, and the V at the end is for Wicket. And the M at the end over here is for Misus. And the meaning of this is Marcus Attilius, he's had one fight, right? Of fights, one. Of wreaths, one. And he won this one. Lucius Recius Felix, 
12 fights, 12 wreaths, he was sent out. Which is a reminder, gladiators didn't fight to the death all the time. You've got expensive slaves, gladiators. They've got their fan base. They liked his fighting. This guy was obviously really good. And so he was sent out. But the guy who, who did this graffiti, he would be a guy collecting baseball cards now. He wants the stats. He wants the details. He's got fans. And we know they loved their gladiators and that they were fans and they had to live longer than one fight because they would have tourist mugs, you know, glasses for tourists with all of your favorite gladiators on them so you could take it home. This is a lovely comb uh, with the name Modestina on it. We don't know what the VH and the two E stands for. Um, and this is one of those cases where maybe there is a formula here. Maybe there was an abbreviation here that every other woman would have known what the VH and the EE mean. Maybe it had something to do with her name or maybe it was an inside thing. We don't know. This is one of those things we don't know, but I love this comb because it reminds me of that everybody's got to comb their hair. And maybe, you know, she had four ornatriques, or maybe she didn't, maybe she combed her own hair, but this is a personal item belonging to someone. And somebody went to the trouble of engraving it. Now, let's get to some fun stuff. And we're looking at this inscription, and now we're thinking, I don't recognize a lot of these letters, right? We've got an M, an I, an X, an I, an M. Maybe that's a V. Then we got this big old swaggy letter here, probably an S, an I, an N. And then we start thinking, what are all of these squiggly letters? So we're gonna bring in our chart here to help us so we can see some of these letters. Um, so the first word is miximus, in, and then lecto, those two straight lines are the letter E. That big letter there is a C. And I'd like to think this is carved into a wall. I like to think of the guy with his stylus really jamming it in there to make those big swashy sort of letters there. So miximus in lecto, fate or, and there's one of those really crazy R's. Fateor pecavimus hospes, si dices quare in nulla matella fuit. Oh, that you should have been a V there. I'm sorry about that. But this is a great one because what it says is we've peed in the bed. I confess, we've sinned. Oh, host, if you say why, there was no chamber pot. As I would say to my students, I don't get that. Why do you pee in the bed? Wouldn't you get up at least and maybe go pee in the corner of the room? You would ruin the mattress. But that's what they did. By the way, the word for chamber pot is metella, M-A, matella, T-E-L-L-A. And that used to be what so many Latin one students would put for metella in the Cambridge Latin course. So I made a little poem. Matella is not a chamber pot. She's not a place to be. So when you go to spell her name, don't use an A, use E. Okay, so we've got a crazy one from somebody who stayed at an inn and couldn't bother to get out of bed. And we have this one that is from, actually, I believe this one's from Herculaneum. This is Apollinaris. Right, we've got, in fact, I love these A's that have the little slash mark, and, and we'll see a whole bunch of them. So Apollinaris, Medicus, um, Titi, Imperatoris, Hikakawit Bene, which means Apollinaris, the doctor of the Emperor Titus, had a good dump here. Because, as I'm sure some of you know, men like to tell you when, when they've had, anyway. Um, so that's, 
you know, you have to wonder about these things that people write on the wall. Now, this one is actually from um, near the area of the amphitheater in Pompeii. It's a warning sign, clearly just scratching up some letters on the wall wouldn't be enough. They painted a picture of a guy taking, you know, using the ground. <clears throat> and it says, Takator Kawe Malum. In other words, please don't do it here or some evil will befall you, my guardian spirit snakes are gonna bite you. So yeah, maybe they had a homeless problem, I don't know. This one comes up in several places around Pompeii and most of the letters are recognizable. I notice that there's one double down stripe sort of E, but the rest of the E's look pretty normal. A mirror te paries non te quitisse qui tot scriptorum taedia sostineas I marvel that you, a wall, haven't fallen down. You who bear so many writers, weary nonsense. In other words, everybody was writing graffiti on the wall. I think it was written up just like people will, will uh, write on the back of a really dirty car, wash me. I think it was a sign of, I think somebody needs to repaint this wall and let's start over. I could be wrong. Uh, you do see inscriptions and jewelry. This one, of course, gives one pause. The master to a slave girl, uh, which is a reminder that, of course, the slave girl wouldn't have a choice but could be in a relationship with the master. Or maybe she liked getting jewelry out of it. This one is um, a little bit more depressing. Not a dog tag. It is a slave tag. Tene me ne fugiam met revoca me a domino meum vivintium in area felisti. I like this one because they're dropping M's, and this signals what we see when we're reading poetry, where we have the elisions, which is the M's were nasalized more, more than we're comfortable with, more than I'm comfortable with. Fugiam, more up in the nose and not so much on the lips. Anyway, hold me so that I don't escape and return me to my master Viventius in Callistus's yard. Uh, so basically, if I'm wearing this on a collar, I shouldn't be where I am. Take me home. Uh, this one, which apparently was discovered not too long ago in London, just a couple of years ago in London, is, is great. This is basically uh, a touristy, cheap gift from the city of Rome, Abbe, Ur, Ab Urbe, when he munus tibi gratum ad ferro, aculeatum, ut habeas memoriam nostram, rogo si fortuna daret opossum, largus ut longa via teu saculus est vacuus. I've come from the city, in other words, I've come from Rome, to bring your welcome gift with a sharp point. You may remember me. I ask a fortune loud that I might be able to give as generously as the way is long uh, and as my, as my purse is empty. In other words, I wanted to give you something really nice, but all I brought back for you was a t-shirt. Um, but everybody used styluses. And this must have had the kind of edges that our wooden pencil has have so that we have all the different sides. So that's kind of fun. Um, and I like that it, once again, those A's, uh, I just, I don't know what I like about that, but I just, I like that kind of shape on an A. Um, quickly to move into the graffiti, because I see I'm not watching my time very well. If you've ever looked at any election graffiti, which there's a ton in Pompeii, it's really called the Pinti, the painted up stuff. Um, there's all sorts of abbreviations to help you read it so you know what you're reading. I like the ones that are in front of the Thermopolium of Vaselina. So in this section over here, we'll look at a very typical one. And this is abbreviated and you can see inner punks are used. Also size of letters help too. So we have Gaius Lollius Fuscus, he's running for Edile, uh, which is one of the offices that uh, there were two Ediles and there were two what we call dual weary or two men that were the chief people. The abbreviations, right? He is uh, worthy. I'm sorry about that thing appearing. There we go. I ask that you make Gaius Lollius Fuscus the Edile. He's worthy of the Republic. Worthy of the Republic. And the OV here, it's really a combination of 
letters a ligature here. Often you'll see with the F kind of built into it, but it's not really showing much here, is the formula oro vos faciatis. I ask that you make him, it's basically please vote for him. So they have all their yard signs painted up on the building. So we see a ton of these. And in fact, on this wall around the Thermopolium, we have Lollius. I love how big these letters are. They're crisp, they're clean. L-O-L-L-I-V-M, Lollium. And we have the little stuff in the middle, the abbreviations that every good citizen of Pompeii would know. Right, he's worthy um, for taking care of the roads and the sacred buildings, elect this guy. And in fact, we've got this over here. And so this is what it looks like today, this bit of graffiti. This is what it looked like, I wanna say early 1900s. Uh, I've forgotten the date, I apologize. Uh, and this hole here was where a sign would have stuck out um, over the sidewalk, apparently. Anyway, you can see more of the letters which have faded now. The wall was crumbling, uh, and so they've saved it. It's no longer on the bricks. But what I liked about this was you've got his name above Lolium. You can see written out. You've got it crowded here, uh, and you've got all this other stuff. But you've got here Asalinas, Asalinas Rogant. And it may be bad grammar here. They're not sure. Maybe there was another word that was supposed to be in here. The, Asalina's girls, but they're taking it to be Asalina's, the, the girls that work for Asalina. They ask that you vote for Lollies and Nexine Marina, who had to have her own little bit here to say, and, and not without me. In other words, and especially me, I ask that you vote for this guy. I don't know why. Maybe he tipped them generously. Now, I stuck this one in because I just want to say to the guy, what happened? Did you add too much water to your paint? This is sloppy. What was going on? Were you down at the end of your red paint and you just, you added more water to get more written? But here's that nice OVF here, all combined. So I ask that you make Trebius elect him. He's a good man. And then I included this other one because it is nothing but abbreviations, but everybody knew these guys. We have Publius Pacuus, uh, Proculus, Aulius Vettius, Caprasius, Felix, these two guys are running for the dual weary position. Marcus Elpidius, Sabinus, Quintus, Marius, Rufus, they're running for the Ediles. And then we have this thing at the bottom. What the heck? I've never seen a name like that. Oh, it's this guy named Emilius. He likes to write his name backwards, which is called an anonym. I didn't know that, but that's what it is. But he always signed his name this way. So he had the sign painter put it this way too, which is just a little crazy. Uh, this one I included because of the movie Tenet that's out. This is the Seder Square. And the Seder Square, um, you can see actually written two different ways. Uh, the later version has Seder first, but the earlier, older version has Rotas first. And it can be read the same way, um, forwards and backwards, upside down, sideways. And it literally means the planter repo holds the wheels with effort, maybe of the plow. Um, it later was taken over um, by Christianity and said, well, hey, look, you can also rearrange the letters to say Pater Noster, our father, and the Alpha and the Omega. So it was a handy thing and it lasted through the Middle Ages. Uh, these were new graffiti from Region 5 um, that came out in 2018. And I just love the guy who was painting up the ones for Albuquius. Look at this nice shape of these letters. I just love it. And I love ligatures, the A-E-D here. I just love it. I, I don't care for whoever was painting the pelvium, Sabinum. Yeah, he can do letters. They're not exactly straight, but there's nothing exciting about these. These have style. I like it. In fact, this one I snuck out of a video that, by the way, Ada Sit Mufai, you can actually watch this through Amazon Prime. Uh, this is Pompeii Disaster Street. You can view it via, you can view it via Curiosity Stream via Amazon Prime. So find somebody with the Amazon Prime account. Anyway, um, when they, you know, and I love this lettering. It's the same guy again. It's that same style. I can tell by the way he makes the M's, uh, and I love his ligature. But then when they did their little recreation in the movie, I was appalled. Look how ugly that is. And they don't even have the letters right. 
They don't have it right. They don't know what they're doing. That's my problem when I get too excited about lettering. But this, this is the most important slide. And this is my last slide, really. So if you can stay for this one, I know it's six o'clock. Originally, uh, Professor Mas Massimo Osana, who's the director of um, the archeological site at Pompeii, posted this when they discovered it. Totally excited because it, it translated, or he thought it translated to be on October 17th. He, in, he overindulged in food, which if you can put up one about, we've peed in the bed and, you know, had a good bowel movement here in Herculaneum. I was so excited. Why not? Although that seemed a little, little odd, but that's what the first pronouncement was of this. And then in the movie that I just mentioned, which you should watch, uh, Giulio Amanati, who is a paleographer in Pisa, said, no, no, this is what it really is. It's uh, that it's, in olearia, this part over here, I-N and then olearia here, and then P-R-O-M-A, Roma, sumpserunt, I can see at least the S-U-M, maybe the P, I, I don't know, the rest I can't read either, uh, but that they took in this delivery, and the movie discusses that they were doing renovations in this part of the house. You could tell there had been a bunch of stuff that had been recently delivered, and so that makes more sense, but the most important thing here is the date. That date there, X-V-I-K-N-O-V, 16th day before the Calends. That means it's October 17th. Vesuvius didn't erupt on August 25th. It was October 25th. So, and there are other things that give us a reason for believing that that is true. Anyway, um, Feel free to go to my website. I'll actually have this Google slide probably up on my website under the race scholastica. But if you want to see how I've turned my love of graffiti into some things um, that are nice for teachers, you can go to my website at jennylindsay.com. And that brings us to the end of our program. So questions. Sorry, I was racing through things. We only had one question in the chat about the graffiti on the walls. Where did it go? I don't remember. Oh, there it is. So it says walls where? So they're asking uh, where these walls would have been, if they would have been in populous areas or? Yeah, most of these walls are in, uh, most of these walls are actually in um, Pompeii. I believe most most of the it's certainly all the election stuff was from Pompeii. Uh, most of the other graffiti is from Pompeii. I know the one from Herculaneum, um, the one with Apollo, um, Apollo Apollinaris, the doctor, um, is from Pompeii. I'm sorry, it's from Herculaneum. Uh, the Sato Repo Square, the nicer one, the stone one. Uh, I want to say was from the east somewhere, but the other one, the first one I put is actually from Pompeii. And, and I've actually included, it's not a totally complete bibliography at the end, but I've put uh, some of the better ones. Oh, the, the stylus was from London and it was just discovered a couple of years ago. I'm happy to go back through any of the slides you want me to go back to. I, I, have, I have a question for you. Sure. The, um, the inscription you showed at the very end with the date. Yeah. Um, get... So you, you are saying or claiming that this this um, implies that Vesuvius erupted later. I guess I'm just yeah. kind of curious. Is I didn't notice myself. Is there some indication of the actual year we're talking about? Oh, because no, could this and not I, be... and I was racing, so I, I didn't explain that. This is written in charcoal mm. it's written in charcoal and because it's written in charcoal something that you know shouldn't shouldn't last for more than what a few weeks i mean i would huh. think certainly on a, on a wall um but that it's written in charcoal is one reason but they've they've suspected that the date's been wrong for some years now because mm. when they've analyzed uh 
things found in amphora, uh, what they've found in the fruit stores, the, the uh, vegetable stores are all things that would have been harvested in the fall. Plus, if you look at some of the plaster casts, some that were done really well, people are wearing long sleeves. Hmm. So it is, and, and in fact, there is a fuller account. Somebody posted, I can't remember if they posted it on Facebook or on Twitter the other day. It was Twitter. A detailed account on why we've been using um, August 25th all this time uh, and the problem with the history of copying down, you know, the, the history of transmission over the ages. Interesting. Well, yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. Yeah, to me, that's just, it's the most important thing. And think about it. Whoever wrote this and wrote it in charcoal, this could have been either like the person that was making the delivery saying, basically, I've made the delivery here. It could have been, I don't know, the steward of the house. It could have been, I don't know, the owner of the house. But whoever wrote this, this person is now one of the most important people from Pompeii because he has given us this insight of understanding when the eruption is. This could have just been the household top slave who wrote this, the, the scribe of the house, the, the, the overseer. We don't know who wrote it, except for he's, he's got some immortality now. And that to me is also cool. I mean, anybody can have their little moment of fame and live forever, even for something as practical as this. I think what you're really telling us is hold on to all our receipts we ever received. Hey man, <laughs> I, I took my, my little $1,200 check I got for the COVID. And I have stuck it inside of my copy of the report. I, I feel like that's one little thing's gonna be a historic item and Years come down, you know, grandchildren may like it. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad that you brought up the, that um, inscription too, because um, I was stumped with the translation, that one part too, and was like, what does this mean? What is this word? So this is much, makes much more sense. And with the way that like, yeah, yeah. it's like a receipt. So right. this makes much more sense. It makes me wonder what we've lost and in if the you past look, then. If you actually watch that video, let me, if you watch this video, uh, when they're talking about it, they're also showing you the whole space uh, where you'll see there is uh, part of what is a grain mill that you would recognize as a grain mill from the big, uh, um, bakeries in, in Pompeii, uh, but it's on the ground. And I think lime had been in it. They were using it for mixing lime as they're remodeling this room. Because remember, what, 15 years or something before, there had been the big earthquake in Pompeii, massive earthquake, lots of destruction. And this is a part of town where they were doing remodeling. And, you know, they can see the remodeling, rebuilding all over the place. And there are some places in Pompeii that never got around to the rebuilding. But this is a place where there's lots of evidence that they were rebuilding this house. I think it's the garden, what they're now calling the garden house. But this is in region five. And so you can see where they probably were taking deliveries. And that makes sense. This area was being used as like storage at that time for all the other stuff. Just like I have a spare bedroom here that's storing all the books that I can't get rid of at half price books right now because of COVID. So, yeah. Any other questions? I'm gonna go ahead and unshare my screen. If there are no more questions about anything I, I had pictured here. <laughs>